Listen, I, uh, I'm not on tube tonight. I was away over there the Easter period, and uh, so I couldn't dedicate the time that I would have liked to put into Job. So I want to bring you something simple tonight. Speak to our hearts, and uh, listen, hopefully we'll still go out encouraged and strengthened. Amen. Come on, we'll read. Ecclesiastes chapter 3. It's a simple portion. It's a wonderful portion. Amen. First one. To everything there is a season. Time for every purpose under heaven. There's a time to be born. There's a time to die. A time to plant and a time to pluck up that which is planted. Time to kill and a time to heal. Time to break up and a time to build up. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. A time to cast stones and a time to gather stones together. A time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. A time to get and a time to lose. A time to keep and a time to cast away. A time to rend, a time to sow. A time to keep silent and a time to speak. A time of love and a time to hate. A time of war and a time of peace. What profit he that worketh in all wherein he laboreth. I have seen the travail which God have given to the sons of men to be exercised. He has made beautiful everything in his time, and he has also set eternity in their heart, so that no man can find out the work of God or the work that God maketh from the beginning to the end. Father, again we thank you for your Son, the Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. We come to you, Lord, now just to bring the word. And the Father hears tonight, Lord, will not just hear the voice of a man, but that they would hear the voice of God, that they would know the voice of God, that they would either hear, Lord, the voice of the Good Shepherd or the voice of the Great Evangelist, but that, Father, tonight, that they would hear your Son, the Lord Jesus, and that they would hear it through the Spirit of God speaking. And Father, we'll be careful to give you all the glory and all the honor because there is no one like Jesus. So Father, bless, move, and undertake. And Father, if you see fit tonight to move in the part of your spirit, then Lord, who are we to stop and stand by and say, Lord, no. But Father, rather, would you come and manifest your power? Because Lord, starting with me, right to the very back, we need you. We need you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Folks, Solomon, in the book of Ecclesiastes, runs through, if you want, a, a summary of what life will be. Time to be born, a time to die. I don't know if you realize that the day you were born and the time you came out that the midwife or the the doctor, whoever it was, but more than likely the midwife, recorded the exact time that you were born. You were given a time, maybe even before you were given a name. Because some babies are born and parents don't have a clue what they call them, other than aliens. And that's the truth. Now, let's be honest. Aliens, when they first came when they first came into the world. But before you had a name, you were given a time. And it was the time you were born. And so, along with that, there will be a time you're going to die. And you know what's going to be on your death certificate? The time that you have died. Where a doctor or a coroner will come out, whether it be to your home or to the hospital or wherever, and they will record the very time, the date, the hour, and the minutes that you have died. And in between that, Solomon gives us this, this recording, if you want, of what life is going to entail. Hardships, good times, struggles, tears, losing, reaping, laughing, weeping, all sorts of emotions. And, and for anybody that's probably lived long enough, you've already experienced them. You've experienced what it is to weep. 
You've experienced what it is to laugh. You've experienced what it is maybe to go hungry. You've experienced maybe what it is to eat like a king. You've experienced what it is to be able to sleep and not be able to sleep. You've experienced what it is to have finances and not have finances. You've experienced what it is to have health and not have health. And that's life. And so, t- so many times people ask the question, why has God allowed this? Why has God allowed this to come into my life? Why? 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 And, and folks, I would simply say sometimes it's just life. There is no reason. God's not punishing you. It's simply life. We, we live in a fallen world. We live in a broken world, and we live in a world where you have the freedom of choice. You make choices in your life. You make decisions in your life. You'll make good ones, and you'll make bad ones. I hope and pray you make better ones more than you do bad ones. But folks, life surely is more than that. Life surely is more than all of us trying to find our way in this world, battling and fighting a war, wondering if if life will be good, will it not be good? Surely it's more than that. Surely life is more than you finding young man or woman or older man or woman, the woman or man of your dreams. Surely it's more than that. Surely it's more than just thinking that life's about getting a wife or getting a husband, having kids, having a home, having a car, having a great job. Surely it's more than that. Because let's be honest, folks. Even people that have all of that, and even though they have the nice car, they have the nice home, they have what appears to be the great family, still deep down, so many of them are so unhappy. So many people are wandering around in this life and in this world looking for life at its crescendo that it, that it, that it is the best it will ever be. And they're striving for it. They're trying to get to it. They're wondering, how can I get there? Surely life is more than education. Surely life is more than and people with great minds simply wanting to dominate in their field. And we thank God for people that are educated. Thank God for people that God has used with education and business in mind. Thank God, of course we do. But surely even in that, life is more important. Surely life is more important than business. Where people are trying to make the next million, the next the next thousand, the next hundred thousand, the next five hundred thousand, where they strive, where they, they're up at night and they're thinking to themselves of the way the markets are, the, the way the dollar's going, and surely life is more than that. Surely life is more than a man working himself to the bone, working hours upon hours. Folks, if COVID taught us anything, did it not teach us? Surely that family and life and living is more important than working. And I don't mean, I don't mean shouldn't work, but I mean that we, we were, we're in the office and our lives are consumed with work, with business, with making money, with getting more than we ever need. And here's the truth. Let's be totally honest. The more you get, the more you'll buy. The more you have, you'll want a bigger house, you'll want a better car, rather, rather than a, oh, well, I don't know what's out there. Let's take my Volvo, for example. If I had more money, I'd probably want a Porsche. Because that's the human nature of our hearts. The more we have, the more we want. We're not content with a car that's five years old, ten years old. Well, maybe not ten, but five years. We want a car that's brand new. One year old, two year old. You see, the more we get, and it's not to say you shouldn't have a nice car. I've often said to you, one day I might roll up in a Bentley, you never know. Probably not, but anyhow, that's just maybe a dream. But, but, but my point is this, folks, the more we get, the more we want. We are never satisfied. You can get a pay raise of a thousand pound a month tonight. I'll tell you the first thing you'll not be doing is giving more into the coffers. 
You'll be thinking to yourself, oh, what can I buy? Online, Amazon, what else is out there? Am I right? You'll be thinking, well, here I can maybe get a mortgage a wee bit more and I could get a house. And You see, that's the way our minds think. The more we have is the more we want. The more we can, we're never content. So many people run about striving in business to have the better car. It's like, look at what I've got. Remember one businessman telling me that in business, the main thing to have was a nice pair of shoes. And if you didn't have the nice pair of shoes, then you weren't classified as a real businessman. And I remember asking, well, what does that mean? What, what, what do you mean a nice pair of shoes? If I rolled up with a lovely pair of brand new spanking shoes, shine out of Primark, would that be all right? Oh, no. So it wasn't about a nice pair of shoes. It was really about the type of shoes with the brand and the label. The Primark ones wouldn't cut it. Is that is, folks? Is that what it becomes? Is that what life is all about? Is life... Even for so many, the struggle with addiction and heartache and pain and depression and fear and work. And, and as we go from the business person to the, the person on the other side of the extreme, is that, is that what life then is supposed to be? I, I don't believe so either. And whilst the times life is struggle, whilst the times life does have pain, whilst the times life does have addictions, whilst time does have fears and worries, is that what life is really all about? Folks, let's be brutally honest tonight. There will be times in our lives when we will be doing brilliant, but there will be times in our lives when we will be doing tragic, terrible. There'll be times in your life where you wish glory wouldn't come quicker rather than sooner or rather than later. And there'll be times in your life when life will be so good that glory can wait for just a wee bit. And that's the dynamics of church life. Because there'll be people sitting here tonight wishing to themselves, oh, I can't wait for the Lord to return because my life is such a struggle. And then there'll be people here tonight that are living on the crest of a wave. Life is brilliant. Life is good. And they're wondering to themselves, my Lord, maybe you could wait for just a wee bit until you return because life is so good at the minute. And that's, is that not the truth? Have we all not been there? Have we all not been honest with ourselves? Life is more surely than that. And here's what I would say. You were created more than all that I've just read to you out of the book of Ecclesiastes. You were really created for eternity. Your life is about eternity. Your life is an eternal life. It is a life that is not just in the flesh, that is not just a tabernacle of the flesh, that is not just flesh, bones, and blood, and tissue, and cells, but you have an eternal existence. You have from the very beginning of time when man was ever created that God himself breathed into the life of Adam or into the body of Adam. Adam became a living soul because God had breathed on him or in him to his nostrils. The psalmist says, I will praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works and that my soul knoweth right well. Another translation puts it this way. I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Who can gaze upon even the model of our anatomy without wonder and awe? Who could dissect a portion of the human frame without marveling at its delicacy and tremble at its frailty? Folks, we are made in wonder and awe. But the greatest wonder of it is this. That in you and in me is eternity, even if you're not saved. There is no such a thing as dying and then straight into an abyss. Regardless of what the world might teach, the Bible teaches that from the day you were conceived in the womb, you had an eternal soul. 
that even if someone should die in the womb, they are straight to glory because of the eternity that God has set in the heart of every man. He's not talking about a physical heart that is just beating. He's talking about the very essence of a soul. Eternity is in every person. You were created for more than just 70 years of existence. Some of you might get 70. Some of you might not. Some of us might not. Many people in the world already have never made it to 70 years of age. And the truth is, as I look at you and as you look at me, there will even be some of us in this room tonight will not make it to 70 years of age. You will not get your three score and ten. And if by reason of strength, a few And if you do get a few more, read Ecclesiastes chapter 12 because the end is looking bleak. It's not looking brilliant. Solomon gives us a record of what the human life will be after 70, really, for some even 60s. But he gives us a record of what the human life will be. He tells us in Ecclesiastes 12 that such will be even our minds we'll not be able to sleep properly anymore. Does anybody have that problem yet? The Bible says you will be up with the birds. It says you will be up before the birds. He says your hair will go white like almond, and even some of you will go bald. He even explains that there's some of you teeth will fall out. God help us. You may get a good insurance policy on your teeth. Hallelujah. He tells us that our minds will break, our hearts will fail. He talks about even the ear, the hearing of our ears will grow dim and we'll not hear the mill grind in the faith. He talks about the eyes no longer being able to see how they once did. Is this the best it is, folks? I don't care if you're Mrs. or Mr. Universe. You go to the gym five days a week. I don't care if you eat all the best supplements uh, in the world. I don't care if you take all the best vitamins. Yes, they have a benefit when you're young. But I don't care because there's coming a day when your body will turn around and say, I don't care how good you do. I don't care how good you eat. There's a time under heaven when your body's going to give up. You're going to have an ailment. And you're going to have a struggle. And yes, there's nothing wrong with going to the gym. I just hope you're not one of those people that stand in the mirror and flex your muscles and think to yourself, boy, I look good. No, you don't. You're only a legend in your own mind. Because the truth of the matter is, folks, the truth of the matter is, one day, one day this body is going to fail us. Should I not go to the gym? I don't care. You go to the gym. If you want to eat carrot sticks, you eat them. You want to eat beans, you eat them. You want to eat grass, you eat it. You want to eat steaks, you eat them. You want to eat like a horse, you eat like a horse. There'll be consequences, absolutely. But is this all we're going to live for? Is all we're going to live for to put energy into this body? Is all we're going to live for to invest? Listen, there's some of you guys. I Listen, I know you. And you know me. And you're, you go to the gym and you look after yourselves and all that good stuff. And, and I understand all of that. And, and I understand the importance of all of that. But Solomon is telling us here, in spite of all of that, do not neglect the eternity that's in your heart. There's so many people invest in their lives into this life. We'll see if my They'll eat certain foods. They'll do all these things. But yet they will not invest in the eternity. They will not read the Word of God. And I talk to myself, not just you. If we were to add up at times the pleasure and the leisure we give ourselves, if we were to add up really the truth of what we eat and all we put into our bodies, of all the finances we spend on ourselves, and we compare that to what we spend in the treasure of heaven and eternal value, you will see a vast difference. 
you will see that we falsely weigh up in our lives that it flows very heavily in our flesh compared to eternity. Our finances compare more in the flesh than they do in eternity. Our eating compares more in the flesh than it does in eternity. Our leisure compares more in the flesh than it does in eternity. What am I saying? Be careful to us all that in our lives we time to invest in the eternal matters of our lives. The things of God, the Word of God, prayer, fellowship, worship, praise, giving, tithing, time, all of that. We can focus so much. I, I often, as a lot of you know, I have switched the fishing to the Gulf. That's now my new pleasure, my new hobby. And here's the reality. When we take up these type of sports, we try to be brilliant. Used to be when I was even playing football, I thought I was brilliant. I was brilliant. What am I saying? I thought I was. But the truth of the matter is, folks, we put so much time and effort and energy in. We're trying to get that swing, you know, that it looks so brilliant that I can turn around to Michael and whoever. And it's, you see, that wasn't that brilliant. Where was the TV coming in that moment? That, that's the way we are. But the reality of it is, the Lord's not going to say to me at the end of it all, Lee, do you see that golf swing you accumulated over the years? It was brilliant. He is not even going to say, Lee, by the way, that golf swing, wow, you nailed it. See, Tiger, he didn't have compare to you. He will have zero interest in how well I perform. The only thing that will matter in eternity is the things that we invest into this life in an eternal value, the treasure of heaven. Everything we invest, every person we invest in, every per- God will never forget your prayers. He will never forget the tears you have shed in the eternity. In fact, the Bible says He bottles them in the book of Revelation. He will never forget what you've invested into the kingdom. He will never forget the people you've told about Jesus. He will never forget the stories you've told your loved ones, your families, your sons, your daughters. He will never forget those times when you kneel in prayer in the house when nobody else watches or sees. He will never forget the times when you open up the Word and you just read about Jesus. You see, us preachers are sometimes in danger of trying to get a sermon. God's not interested in me trying to get a sermon. He's trying. God is interested in me getting to know Him. You see, when we think of eternity, we think that it puts the whole world into perspective. I want my family, just like many of you, to one day be in eternity with me. I want my sons and my daughters to be in glory. I want them to be in heaven with me. And I'm sure you want your family to be with you. We want our loved ones, our husbands, our wives, if they're not saved, to come to Jesus. Because the only thing that ever matters is eternity. I think I've told you before of a friend of mine, and I witnessed to him for many years. He was called Sharky. Hey, he comes on my mind from time to time. Because I remember for months upon months, if not maybe a couple of of sharing with him the importance of eternity. He was a hell's angel. And he used to come on, and I think I've said to you before that we were like chalk and cheese. Everywhere he went, he was in the hell's angel's gear, the jacket, the rings on both hands. He knew very clearly of what he was as a dandy that he was in. And I very much would have went about, maybe more so then, in a suit everywhere I went. But but at times we went to play snooker together, and he was in the Hells Angels gear, and I was in the suit, and, and we used to play and many times around that snooker table. We would share, or I would share with him the importance of eternity and his soul. And so often he would open up his heart, and we he would share, but he would never come to know Jesus. And many times 
guy in the snooker room would be inquisitive as us and, uh, and one day braved up the question and says, I, I'm trying to work you two out. And I says, what do you, what do you mean? And we're, we're preparing. And he says, well, you come in in a suit nearly every time and he comes in, well, he comes in the way he comes in and what's the connection we're used to? I, I can't see it. And he says, well, I'm a preacher and he's just a friend. And he sort of looked puzzled. And he went, you're a preacher and he's your friend. Didn't that up? He says, yeah. You see, the only thing that mattered to me was his soul. And if it meant going to play snooker, which I was terrible at, I didn't care. I just want him to come to know Jesus. Shorty, the night he died, phoned me, they asked me to pick him up in hospital from the night before because he had a chest infection. He was staying in the mirror. He says, they're letting me out tomorrow. Would you come and pick me up? Unbeknown to me, he put me down as his next of kin because he had no family. When they phoned me to tell me that night, after he had phoned me at 10 o'clock on a Sunday evening to pick him up on Monday morning, I got a phone call as I was walking out of our after church meeting, after church, to tell me that Shorty was potentially dying and could I come up to the hospital immediately. As I got up there, before I got to the doors, Shorty was dead. And I just remember thinking, oh God, did he come to know Jesus? All that went through my mind. It was no longer the stories of his hardship that mattered. It was no longer the stories of having his house cold in the winter months. It was no longer about not having enough food in the fridge. It was now simply, was Sharky saved? It's all that went through my head. And as I sat there that night in the corridor of the hospital, I remember a nurse coming to me. She says, are you Lee? I says, I am. She says, as I, I was with him when he died. She says, Lee, I'm a Christian. She says, really? She says, and all he done was talk about you and Jesus and the importance of you coming up to see him. And I just went, wow, really. And I thought to myself, maybe, Lord, maybe, just before he died, that as he thought about me and our conversations and all that went on, and a Christian nurse with him, I just began to think, maybe, maybe, he cried out to you before he had eternity. I don't know. Only eternity will reveal that. But I am believing with all my heart that Sharky is in glory. And in heaven, you see, the thing that matters eternity. And there's so many times in life that I've stood at the funerals or took funerals of many. You know the only thing that ever matters is eternity. Where are they? To the Christian, a thanksgiving service of their life has an element of glory. Because in our hearts we know they're with Jesus. Hallelujah. But to the soul that may not be saved, well then it's a different type of message. It's a different type of funeral service. Because we're not sure, but we know that regardless, they are in eternity. In finishing, I would leave you with Luke chapter 12, where the Bible talks about man who has barns. And in those barns, he has great treasures. And he has great wealth and he has great power. And he says, I will build myself bigger and better that I may eat, drink, and be merry. Do you remember I said at the start, when we get more, we want more, and when we have more, we buy more? This man is the example of that. He is a man that all he could see was what he had on earth. He had everything he ever needed. 
He had the wealth. He had the riches. He had the barns. He had the homes. He had the land. He had the luxuries. He had the things that others might not have had. But never once did he consider his soul. Never once did he consider eternity and his eternal value. And the Lord said to him, you're a fool. To the world, he would be called one of the wisest men in the world. He would be titled one of the greatest businessmen that ever lived. He would be titled an Elon of the day. A man so wealthy, so smart, so business intellect. A man who was worth talking to, but God called him a fool. You're a fool. Why did he call this intelligent, smart, educated businessman a fool? Because he never considered his soul. He says, tonight, your soul will be required. He says, and then what? Who will all these things be? Oh, I'm leaving a legacy. It doesn't matter. Legacy doesn't matter. All that matters, the greatest legacy you can leave your family is you're saved. And heaven will be your home. That is the greatest legacy. The greatest legacy you can leave is when a preacher stands up at your funeral or at your Thanksgiving service and is able to say, with an assurance, he can say that we, Jimmy, is with the Lord today. That is the greatest legacy. And so maybe the Lord's speaking to someone tonight. And all you're concerned about yourself, your life, your family, and you have never really stopped to think of eternity. Tonight is the night. And maybe Christian, all you have thought in your Christian life is how to better it. And how it's all about a good life. And how it's all about getting better and getting more. Whilst I believe that God prospers the saints, I also believe that it is up to us and our duty as Christians to invest our lives in the eternity. To live for God. To honor God. To give glory to His name and to live a testimony on the earth that when others look at us, they see Jesus. Hallelujah. Christ died for you. Christ died for me. Why? That we could spend an eternity with Him. Tonight's the night. If you don't know Jesus, to surrender your life to Him. To give your life to Him. Oh, Holy Spirit, right now, let's just ask the Lord to move for a moment, church. To touch the hearts of those that maybe need Jesus tonight. You see, you could be a shark, ready to go home the next day, given a clean bill of health from the doctors. And then that night, life was gone. It could happen that quick. You could have plans for this week. And yet the reality of it is, no tomorrow is promised to no man. Take no thought for tomorrow. For we don't know what tomorrow will bring forth. Oh, it's not that we shouldn't plan. But we should live in the light that we might not be here for it. We could be gone. And we could be in the ground by the end of the week. May I be like tonight, a dead man preaching to another dead man. And saying to you, come on. Life is too short. Get right with Christ tonight. If you're a backslider, stop playing fast and loose with God. Make your salvation sure. 
believe God to change you once and for all. No more going back and forth, taking up the cross and following Jesus. That is your call tonight. In Jesus' name. Father, move right now. If there's someone. Folks, can I ask tonight? If you don't know Jesus, if you don't know that God is your Savior, and you need to know Him tonight, you need to repent of your sin. You need to follow Jesus tonight. Can I invite you to raise your hand in acknowledgement that tonight you would surrender your life to Christ. While our eyes are closed, would you lift your hand and say, that's me. I need Jesus. I need Christ. I need him in my life tonight. I feel there's someone here. We're not going to embarrass you. We're not going to get you to come up the front. We're not going to get you to tell us your name. We're simply asking you where you sit. Would you surrender your life to Christ? There's one man. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Jesus. Is there anybody else who would give their life to Jesus Christ tonight? You'd raise your hand. Come on. He loves you tonight. Speak into your heart. Give your life to him. Is there anyone else before we worship him and before we go? Surrender to him tonight. Maybe you're a backslider. Maybe all you've been concerned about is yourself. Surrender to him right now. Before we go, is there one? Thank you, Lord. Young man, I want you to pray this from your heart and we're going to join you. We're all going to say it out loud. But you pray this from your heart if you're sincere tonight. Father, I come to you in the name of Jesus. And I ask you to save me. Wash me in the blood of Jesus. Fill me with your spirit. And let me from tonight follow Jesus Christ. Help me sow my life into the things of eternity. And let my life from this night forth bring glory to Jesus Christ. In Jesus' precious name I ask it. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. 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 Praise you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We're going to worship him before we go. Amen. Who is roasting tonight? Boy, I am like a turkey up here. I am roasting. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Oh, we're going to wor worship Him before we go. Amen. Come on.